All right, today we're taking a look at a belt and pulley setup. In order to understand the relationship between the torque acting on a pulley and the forces in the belt causing that other pulley to turn. Now in this problem, we're taking a look at a belt and a pulley, but the physics at play here also applies to sprockets and chains. It's just a whole lot easier for me to draw a pulley instead of a sprocket and chain with a bunch of little teeth and lengths of chain. So this assembly consists of an input shaft and pulley, which are connected to an output pulley and shaft by a belt. And the idea being the belt's responsible for transferring force between the input and output pulleys. Now we can relate the tension or the pulling force in the belt to the torque produced in this pulley by looking at all the forces on just a single pulley. So in looking at a single pulley, first there's the bearing force, which is really just the force by whatever it is that's holding this pulley in place. And that bearing force doesn't cause the pulley to rotate. Really all it does is it keeps the pulley from moving vertically or horizontally in response to any other forces acting on this pulley. Now in the case of a belt and pulley, those other forces are actually produced by the belt acting on this pulley. Now the simplest way to view the forces by the belt on this pulley is as though it's actually two separate strings acting on the edge of the pulley. One string trying to rotate the pulley in one direction, and the other string trying to rotate our pulley in the opposite direction. And there's a key to understanding this problem, and that is if we're to produce a torque on this pulley, these two forces by the belt cannot be the same. See, what's really happening in the case of our belt and pulley system here is it's friction that keeps the belt from slipping over the pulley. Now you might think that friction is a bad thing, but here the friction between the belt and the pulley is really what's transferring the force by the belt into the pulley. So if this part of the belt pulls this way to the right, then the friction between the belt and the pulley is going to twist the entire pulley or put a torque on the pulley clockwise. But going back to Newton's third law, action and reaction forces, because friction is acting this way on the pulley, then friction is going to be acting backwards on the belt, ultimately decreasing the total tension in the belt by the time we get around to this other side of the belt. I mean, if you think of this like a tug of war, there's this tension acting this way on the belt. Then in the opposite direction over here, we have friction and the other tension, which means this tension down here has to be less than the tension up here. And the fact that the tension is acting twice on this pulley leads us up to something called the torque equation. You see, torque is just a twisting moment, which is given by the equation, torque is equal to RF sine theta, where R is the distance between the pivot point and the point of application of our force. And F is in fact the force, which in this case is the force by the belt. Now the sine theta term in our equation is the sine of the angle between the radius vector and the belt itself. Now a belt, much like a string, is only able to pull. It can't push and it can't act in any direction other than along the axis of the belt. So, so something really nice happens here. See, a belt which wraps around a pulley will always sit tangent to the pulley, meaning the force by the belt is always going to be at 90 degrees to the radius vector. Meaning mathematically, this sine theta term over here in our torque equation is always going to equal 1. Now because the belt is acting at two different points on our pulley, what we need to do is apply this torque equation at both of these points. You see, this upper strand of the belt is acting at some radius r and pulling with some force. I'm just going to say that's the force by the upper strand of the belt. And down here, we have this lower strand, again, acting at the same radius r, but with some different force. I'm going to just say that's the force by the lower strand of the belt. But the key in relating these two torques to one another is in recognizing that these two forces are really producing torque on this pulley in opposite directions. This upper strand of the belt is trying to turn the pulley clockwise, whereas the lower strand is trying to rotate the pulley counterclockwise. These are two competing torques. And so looking at the total torque over here, we can say that the total torque is really just the sum of our two individual torques by the two sides of the belt. 
And the way we show these torques are competing is by saying that one of these torques is in the negative direction. Now using our equations for torque, we can sub those in and we get this equation for the total torque, which is produced on this pulley as a result of the two forces or tensions in the belt. Now the way we structured the solution, we said that the force in the upper portion of the belt was greater than the force in the lower portion of the belt. But that's not always going to be true. So to make this equation apply a little bit better to any situation, rather than saying this is the force in the upper and lower strands of the belt, let's just call them force 1 and force 2. Now this whole discussion is focused on the output pulley of our little assembly here. But realize that everything works the same way over here at the input. The only difference being, rather than a difference in tensions producing a net torque, like at our output, at the input, the net torque produces a difference in the tensions in the belt. Now, a typical way to take this problem a step further is to look at how much friction is required to keep the belts from slipping over either of the pulleys. And that leads us to something called the capstan equation, which is a topic for another video. So I hope you found this useful. And on that note, that's all for now.